Welcome back. This episode is sponsored by Athletic Greens, and you can use promo code INSANE on your first purchase. Hi, my name is Jessica. I am the daughter of two Cuban parents, one of which was diagnosed with a very rare chronic illness that turned our American dream into a nightmare. So my parents were both born and raised in Cuba, where they met and fell in love. Um, Cuba is one of the communist countries that still exists today. So this means that the state pretty much dominates like all the wealth, the economy. They pretty much make decisions on behalf of the people. So because of this, the living conditions in Cuba aren't the way they are here. Um, For example, there's some areas, especially the areas that my parents were born and raised, that they don't have AC. Some people don't have running water. Um, They don't even have streets. It's more like dirt pavements or dirt roads. And the main form of transportation over there, they don't really have cars. Like if you're to see somebody that has a car, it's going to be like an antique car. Mm -hmm. So like the main form of transportation is literally like horse carriages. Wow. So, like, you get on a carriage and they just go around the town, like, pick up people that, like, want to go around town. And then you have a guy that's literally, like, whipping the horse. Yeah. Telling them to, like, oh, go left, go right, like, go straight. How long so, did your parents live there? All their life wow, until okay. I would say their 30s. Okay. Which is where, where the whole, like, journey starts. Got it. So, um, it's really upsetting just because the conditions in Cuba aren't like they are here. So, a lot of people actually do pass from lack of like basic necessities like Mm -hmm. food medication so it's pretty much like if you live in cuba in parts like this in cuba and you don't have family that live in america or other developed countries where they can send you like food medication or other resources then it's like pretty much impossible to survive on your own over there yeah as sad as that sounds um that's why it was such a huge turning point in july of 2021 when SOS Cuba became a thing. And that was pretty much um, like this huge protest where like Cubans went out onto the streets and they protested all the rising prices that made things like impossible to afford over there. So um, it's really hard to be able to purchase food or the basic necessities that you need because it's so expensive. So um, they basically protested for free elections, free speech, like basic human rights, like what we have here that we don't think twice about, but for them, it's something that they, like, have to go out and fight for. Yeah. So skipping forward to my parents, um, they're going to have their first child, which was my older brother. So when my mom was pregnant with my older brother, um, food was so scarce at that time that literally, like, the only source of nutrition she had would be, like, my aunt, her sister, would, like, come visit her and bring her, like, a cup of milk. Yeah. And that would be the only thing she, like, consumed that day just because there was literally no food. Right. So were your parents working at this time? or um, So it was pretty much just my dad was working. My mom, she was like at home helping out her mom and okay. her sisters and things like that. But my dad was working. So even with him working, it just like wasn't even enough to afford? No, okay. no it was not. So um, when she actually gave birth to my brother at, I would say like 28, 29 years old, she weighed about 80 pounds. Wow. So if Tiny. that doesn't show right. you just how bad it is. Yeah. So speaking about my dad working, um, he worked at this um, shop that was not in the same town that my mom lived in at the time. So it was like a few hours away. Um, so he worked with two of his very close friends. So one of my dad's best friends that he worked with, he called him and he asked him, hey, do you want to go? And my dad thought he meant, oh, go to another part of town to see where my mom was living at the time and he was like no do you want to go to the United States and my dad laughed at this he was like what do you mean like that's crazy yeah and his friend told him if you do want to go don't tell anyone what you're going to do don't tell them where you're going just say you're visiting your family so because at this time there was no cell phones or anything like that um again like very poor part of Cuba um, my mom was under the assumption that he was just working. So when your dad was working, because it was a few hours away, he was typically like staying where he was. Right. Okay. Yeah. So he so wasn't like commuting back and forth. Yeah. So there would be days where like she wouldn't see him. Okay. So uh, this kind of helped with him being able to flee mm-hmm. because since it was under the assumption that, oh, he's he's working, he's at work. Um he decided to go through with the plan because it was all it was all planned out. And his friend actually let some of the other guys know. And he was like, I have someone that can come with us, speaking about my dad. Mm-hmm. 
So my dad decided to go through with it and leave Cuba with his friends because, like I said, everybody just wanted to get out because they were so desperate to live a better life. Right. Um, especially for my dad that and my mom, they were going to have my older brother. So it's like a new baby coming in. Like you want to give your children like the best life possible. So that was like my dad's headspace going into this. Um, everybody so desperately wants the American dream, especially during this time. So my dad went through with it. They all met up at this church nearby where they worked. And then they traveled to where they kept um, what they were going to use to flee. And it was literally like a makeshift raft, like a little raft with like timber and like other materials thrown on it to try and like make something float. Mm -hmm. And miraculously, it worked. Wow. (laughs) They used this little raft to literally go across the Atlantic Ocean towards Florida. That's to the crazy. United States. I know. It's literally insane. So was your mom going with him at this time or not yet? He was going alone he at He was first. going alone okay. with a group of five other men. At Got this it. Time. So okay. It was a and your mom six. didn't know at this she point. She didn't know. Okay. No. So this whole journey of him fleeing was a seven-day process. So it was a week long of literally all the chaos that is about yeah. to happen. When that, I'm still like stuck I know, on, the, on I know. the floating the boat across the Atlantic I know. Ocean. So was I. That sounds like a movie. I know. Like Life oh of Pi, that one movie. That, that is yeah. crazy. Okay, continue. Yeah. Sorry. So, yes, they used this little raft to travel across the Atlantic Ocean towards Florida. So a lot of the guys that my dad was traveling with, um, their dads actually lived in Miami. Mm-hmm. And my dad's dad happened to also live in Miami. Okay. And there was this one time where he wrote his dad a letter. And his dad responded and he said, if you ever want to come to the United States, I'll greet you with open arms, like, Mm -hmm. and um, wrote his address that he lived in Miami. So they were all going to go see their dads, like move to the United States because they all had their dads in Miami. My dad actually wrote his dad's address on his foot with a marker. That was his way of just knowing what his address was, where he was going. (laughs) Yeah, so it's actually crazy because during this um, these seven days of them trying to leave, they encountered so many like obstacles that you would think, oh, they did get caught. Like right. they're not going to make it. So I think it was like their first night heading out. There was like a lighthouse. You know how the lighthouse like shifts? Yeah. Like that like mm-hmm. it literally like landed a spotlight on their raft for like 10 minutes straight. And they had to like duck and hide because they're like, yeah, they literally they Wait, know we're going to get caught. And nothing happened. Nothing happened. Wait, I love this because it literally feels like I'm like watching a movie. No, I'm, I like, know. Envisioning I know. this, this is so it's so intense. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so, so the, it was the lighthouse was shining the light on their raft for like a good like ten. And minutes they were just or hiding. So. They were hiding. They were like, okay, like we're gonna get caught. Like the coast right. guards are gonna come and take us. Yeah. But that didn't happen. Like literally, nothing happened. Um, and so they just kept rowing mm-hmm. <laughs> their raft. Um, there was a bigger boat that they encountered that was coming like full speed towards them they don't know who was on this boat but they think that they were trying to like hit their boat on purpose with like malicious intent or something so they literally had to like row as fast as they can to get out of that boat's way and they managed to do so which is like so crazy to me right in a little raft in a little raft yeah that's not um also they had a shark that was swimming underneath their raft for like a good while of the time that they were sailing (laughs) which is insane like a little a little shark under the raft. Oh my god. But no shark attack, so it was good. Wait, I just need do you know any like what this raft was made of? I don't know. I would like to know. I just like I'm like envisioning like this tiny little raft. Keep in mind they don't at this time there was no like like mat- tools, tools right? Tools or yeah. materials to make something like a boat that you have here. It's literally like handmade raft they were supposed to make it to their destination yeah because like anything that got in their way they just like they, kept exactly. going exactly that's that's what i always say when i like talk about this story that yeah. they were meant to make it like Absolutely. my dad was meant to come to this country i'd say so yes oh my gosh that's and crazy. um this is the one that actually like gave me chills mm-hmm. so there was a storm like a really bad storm that was like heading their way mm-hmm. and the one friend that was kind of like in charge of like the whole like journey because he had experience like with boats and stuff like that um he said whoever here believes in god you better start praying wow because it was a really bad storm that was about to hit them so for somebody for somebody that has that experience yeah traveling the ocean to know it's gonna be bad so my dad actually thought that they were just gonna die 
right. with that whole storm coming they were like okay yeah this is the end of it um he actually wrote a book which is where all this is listed so his whole experience of him fleeing cuba to the united states is written in his book so he thought they were going to die when the storm was about to hit but one of his friends said hey look the sun's coming out like we're good yeah. nothing happened which so did is, the storm hit at all? Do you know? It just it didn't. didn't. Okay. That's the part that gave me like the most chills because right. the fact that his friend said, whoever believes in God, you better start praying. I was like, oh my God. Yeah. Like that's insane. Right. Um. So yes, just continuing that week long process. There were some islands that they managed to land and kind of like seek refugee for a few days mm-hmm. because like rowing day and night right. is very tiring. They have to get rest. Yes. So um, they landed in this one island. I forget exactly what the island was. But um, they kind of um, set up camp, I guess you would say, in this little area. And they um, saw some fishers that were from Cuba as well. And they were nice enough to lend them food and water and wow. like some stuff to like make food. Yeah, I was going to say, did they did they pack up like any type of food when they went? No. No. OK. So this like group of fishers, they came and offered them food, water, just anything to like Mm -hmm. basically try to cook up a meal but they couldn't take them on their boat just because they could get in trouble like if there's a coast guard that catches them like they're all right they're all pretty much screwed so um this night that they were on that island there's actually a boat of coast guards that i believe they knew they were there because they were literally heading to the island that Mm -hmm. they were staying at yeah so this whole day they were hidden under like some really tall bushes for like hours because the coast guards were like literally surrounding the island they literally found the area that they set up like base and they were knocking over like all the stuff oh my gosh so they they didn't like go looking past where they were set like where they saw what was set up so they were looking around the island but the fact that they were hidden for hours got it they were never found okay so um hours later it was nighttime they came out because the coast was clear the coast guards were gone and they said okay this is it because they were at this point, they were really close to reaching coast of Florida. Mm-hmm. And this is it. We're going to do it. We're just going <laughs> to yeah. sail up to America. So uh, they did it. They managed to come to America. No casualties. Everybody made it safely. Um, my dad, the address that he wrote mm-hmm. on his foot washed away, obviously, because right. of the seven day like chaos that was going on. But he remembered the address. OK, good. He remembered it. So once he made it to Florida he went and found his dad. So he was with his dad for a while until he went to New Jersey where he worked as a truck driver, Mm -hmm. just trying to make ends meet. At this point in time, he literally had no connections in America besides his dad that was in Florida, but his dad was never present in his life. So it was kind of like, let me just kind of do my own thing, you know? He actually came back down to Florida because he was trying to save up to bring my mom and my older brother who was now about like three years old at the time. And they were so in Cuba. he was Cuba. gone for a while. He was gone for a while. Okay. So he was living in America about, I'd say, three to five years by himself. Like no family here. So when did your mom figure out he was like just <laughs> peaced out and gone? That's the thing. Okay. Um, she actually, he actually managed to make a phone call somehow okay. from America to Cuba and got in contact with my mom. Okay. And that's how she knew, oh my God, he's... He's in America. Like, he literally fled fled Cuba. So kind of bittersweet, you know? Mm -hmm. He's obviously trying to work to provide a better life for my mom and my um, older brother. My mom and my older brother were able to come to the United States. And in 2001, they moved to Naples, Florida, which is where I was born. And we lived there for about four years or so until 2005 when we moved to where we live now. And my younger sister was born. So it was the five of us. And our very first house was a very tiny, it literally looks like a tiny home. Mm -hmm. There was only two bedrooms and like one tiny bathroom. So imagine like the five of us just trying to live our life in this very tiny house because my dad managed to get a job at this grocery store that was like across the street. So it was very easy for him to go. He worked as a butcher, like cutting up meat and stuff like that. So he was kind of trying to make ends meet again, starting from rock bottom, having no family here that we could turn to for support, them being immigrants that didn't speak a word of English, right. and my siblings and I being children. Yeah. Like, it was it was very difficult. 
Um, one day, my dad, he kept dropping the knife that he used to cut up the meat at work. And so some of his coworkers, they were like, hey, let's go take you to the hospital, see what's going on, because he couldn't get a firm grasp on anything. Mm -hmm. So they went to the hospital. They waited in the emergency room for, I think it was about six hours or so for him to finally get seen. Doesn't surprise me. Yeah, right. So when he finally got in to see the doctor, she immediately recognized his symptoms. And she told him, you have ALS. I'm not going to tell you what that is, what that entails. Go home and Google it. Mm-hmm. So for a doctor to tell you to go home and Google it, right. that's insane. That's like the opposite of what they tell you to do because usually Google tells you like the worst possible So they just told him scenario. and then basically sent him yes. on his way? Yes. Um, when my dad got home, he used our – we had like a computer in the mm-hmm. living room and he was searching up what is ALS, like what the heck is this? Obviously the first time hearing this. Yeah. My mom was seated next to him, like, looking over her shoulder because she was like, yeah, I want to know what this is, too. Um, When they saw what ALS was and the life expectancy for people that are diagnosed with it, they started crying their eyes out. ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, is a very rare nervous system condition. I think it only affects about less than 20,000 people in the U.S. per year. This is basically a nervous system disease where all your muscles eventually just stop functioning. So when my dad went to the hospital and saw this doctor, it's because the disease had already started spreading towards his hands. Mm -hmm. So he basically like couldn't grab anything. He couldn't hold anything. He couldn't bend his fingers anymore. Like he was literally losing all the strength in his hands and his fingers. This slowly started spreading towards his feet and his legs as well. So it's becoming very hard for him to walk. So at this point, he was falling so many times in public. Like he would take us to the mall and he would, his legs would buckle and he would just fall over. Because since all the muscles in his legs were getting weak, he didn't have the strength to walk normally. Like he literally had to keep his legs stiff and kind of like drag his feet on the floor. Like that's how he could walk, I guess you could say. Because if not... His knees would buckle and he'd just fall. So after he went home and kind of researched it and figured, and him and your mom figured out what was going on and what he had, did he ever go back to the hospital after that? Or they were kind of just like, it is what it is. We just have to kind of live with it. They were like, it is what it is pretty much. Um, Again, it was something foreign to them. Right. Like it is to a lot of people. Like this disease isn't really something that's as well known. Yeah. Is there any type? Like, so it's, it's not treatable. Correct. No. Okay. So, but is there any, like, do you know if there's anything that hospitals or doctors can do to kind of like help, like medicines and stuff like that? So, there is no cure for this mm-hmm. and there's no known cause for this disease. Like, scientists don't know why it affects some people and then other people don't get right. it. Um, but there are studies that suggest maybe it's because of genetics or mm-hmm. environmental factors, but that doesn't really right. specify anything. The only thing that can really treat ALS I guess you can say is just physical therapy to reduce discomfort but at the end of the day there's no cure for this sickness so it started spreading in my dad's body pretty quickly so since it started in his hands and his arms he wasn't able to perform at work the way he wanted to like he would drop all the boxes at work he dropped the knives Mm -hmm. um since it started spreading to his legs and his feet he would fall so he couldn't even walk at this point Um, but even though this was all affecting him and he was going through this, he didn't let that stop him from being our dad and being like the male figure in the house. So even though he knew it was risky to go out in public and try to walk because he could literally fall at any second, he would still take us to the playground. He'd take us to the mall and he's such a great father. Yeah. He didn't want to lose those. He didn't want to lose those moments. Like he didn't want to let his disease define him or Mm -hmm. take anything away from him. Yeah. Which is amazing, honestly. Yeah. I remember this one day we went to my elementary school, like open house, one of those events. Mm -hmm. And after we parked our car, his foot hit the parking block and his knees buckled over that. And he literally fell like face first onto the grass. And at this point, his hands were too weak to like hold himself up. So he would literally just fall on his face because he didn't have the strength to hold him to hold himself up so we had 
like three men rush over and like help him up because my dad was a very big man. Mm -hmm. He was tall and he played a lot of sports, a lot of soccer. So he was very muscular. So it was impossible for my mom to pick him up or my siblings that were literally kids at this time. Um, There was one instance um, at the house. One night he fell in the living room. And since my mom was too weak to pick him up, she had to drag him across the floor and put him on a mattress and that's where he slept the whole night until we can get help from the homeowners in the morning. Yeah. So the house that we lived in, this tiny house that we lived in, um, the owners were actually this Cuban couple that they had became good friends with. And because they knew of our situation, they charged us fairly low on rent, mm-hmm. just trying to help us yeah. out. But obviously, my dad's condition was progressing rapidly to the point that he couldn't work anymore. There was one day that his coworkers just had to bring him since he worked across the street. They brought him across the street, like one on each side of him, holding him up. Hey, he keeps falling. Like he can't do this anymore. So he stayed at home for a whole month. Couldn't work anymore. He was like, I can't walk. I can't do anything. He was at home without working for a month. That's when he kind of realized I'm not going to be able to go back to work. So he was put on a wait list for an electric wheelchair because that was now the solution to this that he would have to be in a wheelchair it was about a six month wait for him to get this wheelchair jeez so in this time was your mom having to help him like use the bathroom and pretty much do everything so my mom during this time of him like working at the grocery store and him starting to get these beginning symptoms she worked at a restaurant okay but since the severity of my dad's condition was just getting so bad and he couldn't go back to work she quit her job Mm -hmm. And she was like, I'm going to take care of my husband. So she basically became his like 24-7 at home nurse. She became his caregiver. Mm -hmm. So my dad, he couldn't use the bathroom normally because he couldn't stand up and walk. Mm -hmm. So my dad's friends had made a little bathroom for him outside where he would be able to shower. And so my mom can do that easier for him. So she did quit her job. She was at home all the time taking care of him. My dad wasn't working now. And my brother, sister, and I were all kids. So obviously, we weren't working either. This started our financial problems. There was no money coming in. So we were struggling a lot to get by and trying to make ends meet every month. And this meant that we weren't able to make payments on our house, like pay the bills or pay rent. So the homeowners evicted us. So at this time in my life, when I was seven years old, when I was a child, I had really bad asthma and I had to use a nebulizer for this to treat it whenever I had like really bad wheezing and things like that. And so since we weren't able to pay our bills, they had shut off our electricity, our water, like everything. Mm -hmm. And we had to connect my nebulizer to our van that we had, which is our car at the time. And that would power on my nebulizer. And that's what I would use for my asthma. So word of our situation, like it got around and there's actually a news station. I don't remember exactly what news station Mm -hmm. it was, but they actually came to our house and they interviewed us. They interviewed our situation. They just wanted to let people know this is how they're living. Yeah. Their seven year old child is having to use her nebulizer powered by, by the van. So they showcase like my dad on his wheelchair, my mom pleading for help me and my siblings as kids like very helpless and we actually had this one very sweet couple that flew down to florida because they saw us on the news and they like gifted us like boxes of water and food they were just very sweet it's amazing so we did have a lot of people in our childhood that reached out and kind of helped us because they knew what we were going through we did go to church at this time as kids so we had a lot of people that would help us out because You know, they knew our situation. They felt bad. They wanted to help these kids out. Mm -hmm. Their parents were struggling financially, emotionally. So we did get evicted from our first house. But with the help of the news and all the support, we were able to find a better house. Amazing. Yeah. We moved to our second house and the news station actually came back for a second and last time to kind of broadcast this as a Christmas miracle because it was around Christmas time. So they came back. They showed around our new house because it was it was so big. So it was something yeah. we, we weren't used to. We were like, right. wow, we went from this little house to this house. So we were very thankful. 
Our sponsor for today's episode is Athletic Greens. I personally love taking AG1 every morning when I'm feeling foggy, sluggish, and just need to boost my mood and start off my day right. It not only helps with my gut health and my digestive health, but also with my mood, my immune system, and I have seen the biggest difference in my hair, skin, and nails. Over the last few years, it has been the biggest challenge for me to find supplements that work for my body and to figure out what my body really needs in order to feel energized and good throughout my day. And ever since adding AG1 into my daily routine, I have felt all of the things that I didn't feel before, even when trying to take supplements. And the reason that is, is because AG1 has so many vitamins and minerals that can basically take the place of supplements and leave you feeling refreshed and having the best mental clarity as soon as you start your day. There are so many mornings that I am just in a rush and I'm trying to run out the door and get to the gym early so I can get my day started. And that is when the single serving packs come in handy. I always keep them in my car so I never miss a morning of my AG1 powder. You literally... Just have to mix them in water, and just like that, your day is starting off healthy, easy, energized, and right. So that being said, if you are looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Just go to athleticgreens.com slash insane. One more time, that is athleticgreens.com slash insane. Go check it out. So we lived at this house for a few years. Um, I did start middle school during this. There was one day that my mom, my sister and I had came back from my middle school because we were having a conference night with our teachers. And it was about 6 or 7 p.m. when it ended. We got home and my brother was on the living room computer just playing some games. But my dad wasn't around. Keep in mind, at this time, he was using the wheelchair to get around the house. And we were like, hey, where's dad? And he said, oh, he's still sleeping. This immediately, like, rung a bell. We were like, how's he still sleeping? It's like 6, 7 p.m. So we ran into the bedroom. Um, He slept in his wheelchair next to my mom's bed. So it was my mom's bed, and he would kind of lay back on his wheelchair next to her bed. We went in. He was asleep. And we were like, this isn't normal. So my mom started tapping his face to wake him up. He wasn't waking up. I started freaking out. Keep in mind, I was like, 11 12 Mm -hmm. years old during this and i was seeing what i thought was my dead father right in front of me i was slapping his face and like yelling for him to wake up and nothing his eyes would like roll to the back of his head and i just started bawling i was yelling at my brother like you better call 911 i was going just crazy to the point where like my mom and my brother had to like put me in like one of the bedrooms and like leave me there until i could calm down i was literally like kicking scratching at the walls crying and my brother did call 911. Obviously, since he spoke English, he mm-hmm. was translating to the dispatcher what was going on. And I just remember during this whole ordeal, I was like on my knees, just crying and praying. Like, I, this is like the most I've prayed in my life. Um, just growing up and being at church, God was like a huge factor in our in our life at that moment. And so I was just begging to God. I was like, please don't let my dad die. Like, please, please, please don't let him die. And... It was it was really scary. The paramedics came. They took my dad. Again, he was still unconscious. We didn't know what was going on. They strapped him up to the stretcher and they took him away with my older brother so he could translate and see what was going on. So it was just me, my mom and my sister at home now. And she called one of her friends to come and kind of watch over us Mm -hmm. because she wanted to go to the hospital and see what was going on as well. So she managed to call one of my dad's friends and said, hey, can you please take me to the hospital? Something happened to him. Like, I need to go. So they went. My mom's friend stayed with my sister and I that whole night, kind of comforting us and making sure we were okay. Again, we were freaked out of our minds. My sister was so much younger than me. And I was only 11, 12. So this was just very traumatic for Mm us. The ALS had already started taking effect on my dad's lungs at this point. And his lungs just failed. So the reason he was unconscious and wasn't waking up is because he wasn't getting oxygen in his lungs. His lungs just stopped functioning. They had to like open a hole in his throat and connect him to a ventilator, which would be breathing for him. It would do like artificial, right? artificial breaths for him. So uh, this is when they knew, okay, he's going to have to live connected to a ventilator from now on because his lungs just completely gave out. Mm-hmm. So we didn't know if he would make it or not because this was something that was 
very drastic that he would have to live breathing off of a ventilator. So he came back home after this whole thing happened. He was now connected to this ventilator. So because of this, it would start affecting the way that he would speak. So he would like manage to say a few words and then this ventilator would like breathe air for him. So it would kind of interrupt his words, like a few words and breath, mm-hmm. breath. Um, so it was just very hard to like see all this unfold, especially as a kid. It's like, I felt like there was nothing I can do except just watch my dad slowly die every day. Right. Because. And I'm sure for him too, it was extremely oh my gosh. hard and frustrating. It was very frustrating for him because again, like being our dad and him wanting to be there for us, he felt like he was letting us down in a way by getting sick, but it wasn't his fault. There right. was nothing we can do about this. So even though he was connected to a ventilator, was using an electric wheelchair at this point, he would still go out of his way to do things for us. He would take my little sister and I and like walk us to Dunkin' Donuts and go get donuts, you know, around the corner. There would be events at school, like the Dr. Seuss parade that we had, and he would literally take his electric wheelchair and go to the school under the hot blazing Florida sun Mm -hmm. to just be there and see us do the parade. And, you know, this is when I knew that my dad was very strong and he was a warrior and he wasn't going to let this disease define him or get the best of him. He was going to keep being our dad and do everything for us, despite what his health was looking like. So it started becoming uncomfortable for him to be on the wheelchair now because, again, all the muscles in his body were now like slowly deteriorating. So it was uncomfortable for him to like sit on the wheelchair for long periods of time. It just caused a lot of pain for him so we ultimately had to get a special bed for him which is the kind of beds you would see like in the hospital Mm -hmm. that have like the different features and buttons so he ended up um being bed bound now so from electric wheelchair to being on a bed um during this point we had transitioned we moved to our third house so we were in a different house now he was bed bound now so lots of changes so Even, at this point, how many years had it been? So at this point, I would say this was around 2014, 2013. Okay. So um, for ALS, the ex- the life expectancy for somebody that's diagnosed with ALS is three to five years after their symptoms first start. Wow. Okay. So my dad had surpassed this life expectancy. Okay. He actually was fighting fighting ALS for 15 years. Wow. Before he passed. Yes. Okay. So way longer. He lived way longer than the life expectancy. So he was, I'm telling you, he was a fighter. Yeah, I was going to say, he was a fighter. You literally took the words out of my mouth. He was a fighter. Literally the strongest person I've ever met in my life. So now that he was bed bound at home, he was able to spend more time on his computer because although this disease took so much from him, he was still like very tech savvy. Like my dad was like super intelligent when it came to like computers and like making things online so he would even though he couldn't really like hold the mouse or things like that he still had enough strength to kind of like drag his hand around Mm -hmm. so he would literally use that to kind of like work on his computer which is insane to me he was determined to make it work and he actually due to this he actually was able to um make papers for people that wanted to bring their families over from cuba so people would literally come to our house for him to like make documents and papers for them i know so he was very determined to do everything that he could do despite his condition he didn't give up even when he never gave up no so he would still kind of go on the wheelchair a few times during like special occasions like thanksgiving when he wanted to like be out of the room because he was constantly in bed like 24 7 yeah he couldn't go out do anything at this time he actually became a citizen so he took his citizenship test While he was bed bound. So the officials actually came to our house, did the test. He passed. He became a U.S. citizen. Well, bed bound. Yeah. With his disease. So it was bittersweet because he, even though he was a citizen now, it was like this disease stripped so much away from him and he wanted so much from the American dream. And that was all just taken away from him from this horrible disease that we don't know where it came from, why he got it. There's no cure for it. We're just watching him die. Mm-hmm. So that was very hard for me growing up. Um, 
I used to always like compare myself in my life to other kids in my school. And I would always, I would always ask, why does this have to happen to my dad? Like, what did he ever do? Like, he was such a great dad, a great husband, Mm -hmm. son, brother, everything. So I always had this like deep, like rooted anger Mm -hmm. inside of me growing up, which it's, it's not a good thing, but just seeing the kids in my grade that had parents that were able to do things for them that my parents weren't able to because my dad was sick. It made me really upset. And so growing up as a child, as a preteen, even up to my teenage years, um, I was very depressed because of this, just because I was going through so much in my home life and then having to go to school and socialize, like nothing was going on. It took a huge toll on me. Right. Yeah. So nobody knew what I was going through because I would never talk about it. And I didn't want to make people feel upset or feel like I was burdening them with Mm -hmm. my problems. So in middle school, the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge became a thing, which was a trend that shocked me because it was the first time that ALS had gotten exposure or attention in the way that it did just because it's a rare disease. Like nobody knew what it was. So when this Ice Bucket Challenge became a thing, I was... I was happy about it. I was like, wow, like I feel validated. I feel like people actually know what ALS is. And um, the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge pretty much was you dump a bucket of ice cold water over yourself and you donate $10 to the ALS um, Association, which was trying to which was trying to make money to find a potential cure for the disease. Or you can skip the challenge and donate $100. So in middle school, just because we were kids and it was a trend, the kids in my grade were starting to do this trend. So they would post on Instagram doing the challenge and then tagging their friends. And it made me so mad because to them, I knew we were kids, but it's just in that moment, it was like, okay, it's a trend. They're hopping on the trend just because it's like what's cool for the next month or so. And they're just going to completely forget about it and move on with their day. But for me, it wasn't just a trend that I can forget about in the next month. It's what I had to deal with every day that I went home. I also think from what I remember, it became like just the ice bucket challenge. Yes. Like, like and, completely. No, absolutely. <laughs> and I feel like honestly, like I'm even guilty of that because when you're telling this, like I, if you said to me, oh, do you remember the ice bucket challenge? I've been like, yes. Mm-hmm. But genuinely speaking, I don't know if I would have remembered that it was for right. ALS. Right. Which is actually insane to me yes. now that mm-hmm. when you're saying it, it makes me feel like a horrible piece of shit. No. No, I'm, no. no, I'm just saying though because, no, I know what you're saying, but I agree yeah. with you because people jump on these trends mm-hmm. and because it's a trend, but they don't even know the meaning behind it or it right. loses the meaning it because it meaning. becomes such a, tr- like, oh, dump ice on you and ask, you know, tag your friends and have them do it next. Which is wild because I really don't like I I'm like curious if you would have asked me if I would if somebody would have asked me if I would have remembered that it was for ALS specifically. Yes. Because I it really I feel like that kind of dropped off of it and it was just like oh the ice bucket. Like the ice yes. bucket challenge or just the cool thing to yeah. do. Oh how cold can you get from this ice exactly. bucket. Exactly. Or it was fun. Knowing. It became fun. It yeah, wasn't it became even a fun right. thing. Yeah. Exactly. It wasn't even to spread awareness anymore. I don't think. Yeah. Honestly. I agree. Okay keep going. So that's why like as a kid in middle school like just that on top of me just comparing myself to like all the other kids I'm like oh my god like why why am I going through this and they're not like it made me really just upset and this is what led up to my depressive feelings as I grew up and started high school so I think my depressive feelings started in middle school but I didn't recognize it as depression just because you're a kid you just think you're sad Mm -hmm. you know because this is going on at home I'm just sad But growing up and getting into high school and just feeling the feelings that I was at that time and realizing how much it was affecting me and the way that I was able to function in like everyday life, I knew that it was more serious. So this made me want to become as successful as I can be. So at school, I would always just be an overachiever because I just wanted to be as successful as I can be in school to make my parents proud. In high school, I took like a bunch of AP classes, dual enrollment classes, because my whole mindset was be successful, start working as fast as you can to provide for your family and give them that American dream that 
they weren't able to have. So one day in high school, I actually had like just a huge emotional breakdown for the first time over this. Um, Something just triggered me in class and I just started bawling my eyes out. And that's when it really hit me that, wow, this is affecting me like way more than I would like to admit. And I got help from one of my favorite teachers at the time, um, which he related to what I was going through. So it made me feel it made me feel heard. Yeah. And validated um, just because I felt like nobody else knew what was going on. This disease is something that a lot of people don't know of. And for me, it's like my everyday life. Yeah. So that just felt horrible. And two, I think you were bottling it up for so long and trying to just act like everything's fine, everything's fine, stay strong. But you can only stay strong for so long. You know what I mean? Eventually yeah. it's going to come out randomly or it's during certain times. That's yeah. just, that's how it, like we're human. You know, we have feelings we're supposed to feel, you know? Yeah, so. and I would just, I would try to keep it in the back of like my mind, just like right throw it back there don't pay it's attention easier to it. not to think about the things yes. that are hard until yeah. they explode and they just come up and yeah. you can't control it so that's when i was like okay yeah like this is bad hospital visits became the normal for us because due to my dad's condition he would regularly get like pneumonia and like little things like this well not little things but things like this that would pop up due to his condition him being bed bound for literally 24 7 so just going to the ICU, the intensive care unit, that was like second nature to me. Like just going to the hospital because my dad's there just became normal. So I think I kind of became like desensitized to hospitals yeah. because I was just there all the time. And again, like I said, it was just second nature for us to be at the hospital. So because my mom was my dad's caregiver for so long, again, he was sick for 15 years with this disease and it just progressively was getting worse in different stages. So him not being able to walk to him having to use an electric wheelchair to becoming bed bound to multiple hospital visits. My mom was constantly having to take care of him. And like I said, she was basically his 24 seven at home nurse. So she had to bathe him. And again, since he couldn't stand up or walk and go to the bathroom and she obviously wasn't strong enough to lift him up, she would have to like tilt him on his side and just clean him and do what needed to be done. And this took a lot of strength for my mom and it placed so much stress on her body that she was slowly beginning to get sick as well. And this was so hard for my siblings and I to see because First, my dad is sick, but then having to see that my mom, because she's taking care of him, this is putting so much strain on her body. She was also getting sick. And it's probably she, hard for her to take care of herself, too. Yes. So she was actually lacking a lot of sleep because she would have to wake up in the middle of the night to, you know, help my dad. Right. So because of my dad's condition, he couldn't really move. He could just like move his head, move his like hands like this and his arms around. But if he needed to like switch positions because he was uncomfortable because he was laying on this side for too long, she would have to do it for him. If he was like itchy somewhere, she would have to do that for him. So it's the fact that he didn't even have control over his own bodily functions mm -hmm. at this point. Could he, he still like talk at all? So he could still talk. The only thing is since that disease just keeps progressing, yeah. it was like weakening his vocal, vocal ability, yeah. his vocal cords. So it was very difficult for him to talk. His okay. talks became more of like a whisper, kind okay. of like struggling to get the words out mm -hmm. on top of his ventilator breathing every few seconds. Yeah. So if when having a conversation with him, he had to be very patient because right. it took a while for him to like get his words out. Mm -hmm. So just being a caregiver in itself is a whole thing that I feel like a lot of people don't realize that it puts a lot of strain on your body. My mom was lacking so much sleep because she had to wake up in the middle of the night to help my dad. She always tells me that at this point in time, all she wanted was to get sleep. Like that's literally all she wanted was to sleep because she was so sleep deprived. And she kept getting back pains and back problems from having to lift my dad up. As my older brother was growing up and getting older, he became as responsible as my mom in taking mm -hmm. care of my dad. So between the both of them, they would help bathe my dad, move him around, do the things that he needed to do. Um, some days were harder than others. There's days that he would express to us that he didn't want to live anymore because this disease had just, 
it's taken so much away from him yeah. now that he feels like what's there to live for yeah um i mentioned american dream turned to a nightmare because that's how he would describe it as literally a nightmare for him mm-hmm. between my mom and him they had to take care of him do everything for him I was in high school just trying to get through all my AP classes, my dual enrollment classes, and just try to graduate as soon as I can so I can work and help them out, help my family out. That was always my main goal because we didn't grow up having that like normal family dynamic. My dad was sick. My parents were immigrants, so we didn't have family that lived here. We were pretty much on our own Mm -hmm. until my dad became a citizen and he managed to bring his family from Cuba over. So he brought his mom and some of his brothers, so my uncles. So they were here now with him. And that was a very big accomplishment for him because he wanted to bring them over because he could no longer go back to Cuba. He couldn't go back to his home country because he wasn't physically able to do so. So him bringing his family was something that made him feel fulfilled Mm -hmm. as well as being there for us and doing everything he can to support us even though he was sick. Um, In high school, he would always buy my supplies anything that I needed he would just order it off Amazon and just get it for me because that's what he was able to do right so he was such a supportive father like everything that he could do for us he did it so I graduated high school with my associate's degree because I did dual enrollment at the same time so this immediately took off two years of my college experience so I only needed two more years to get my bachelor's so I was 18 years old when I applied to go to college to finish off with my bachelor's degree. And I got accepted for spring of 2020. So a few months into the first semester of college, it was March. I was about to turn 19 years old. I remember I was walking to my car because I had just finished my college classes. And I was on the phone with my mom because my birthday was in the coming up week or so. And I was like, hey, so what are the plans for my birthday? Um, I was planning to have like a birthday dinner with some of my friends and some of my family that could go, obviously. And she said, this is very bad timing to do this. Your dad's passing away the week after your birthday. And I just remember I just started crying because there was talk about him. Like I said, he would mention to us that he just wanted to pass away sometimes because the disease was too much for him to handle. He was constantly in pain constantly on a bunch of pain meds like he took so many medications Mm -hmm. for him to even get through the day and there was talk that December before my spring semester my first semester of college that he wanted to go to another state so that they can so they can disconnect him and basically just pass away because he was done living with this disease so she told me that he decided that on March 19th the week after my birthday he decided that he was going to pass away and this was very difficult for me to take obviously I always knew one day that he was going to die from this disease but I never wanted to actually accept the fact right that's something that I would always just like push to the back of my head like oh I don't want to deal with that the day isn't here like I'm only I'm not even 19 years old yet how is he going to pass away I ended up having my birthday dinner with my friends and some of my family that could go. The whole time, all I can think about is my dad's going to be dead a week from now. Mm -hmm. And I'm here smiling at this birthday cake and pretending to be okay. So I managed to get through that birthday dinner somehow. So my dad had decided to get an assisted suicide for March 19th. So the hospital had set up the room for him. They had a whole bunch of chairs around his bed for our family to sit down. There was a woman sitting in the room playing the guitar, singing some songs, just trying to make the atmosphere calming, but it didn't take away from the fact of what was actually going to happen in a couple of hours. So it was a very long process. We got to the hospital at 10 a.m. We were all just sitting there crying our eyes out. We thought it was going to be a quick process, but little did we know this day was literally it was and still is the worst day of my life it was such a long process so every hour or so there'd be a nurse that would come in and inject like a lethal dose of the medication that would help him pass on so it wasn't just one no that's what i thought too yeah that is that is so it was literally the whole day like every hour or so somebody would come in and inject a little bit more a little bit more so my dad was like just slowly like 
going out of it just as yeah. as the more like doses went into his body he was just slowly going out of it um i remember when he was still like conscious enough to like know what was going on we all took turns going up to him like saying our goodbyes like saying everything that we needed to say and just hugging him i remember when i went up to him he told me i'm sorry and i said you have nothing to be sorry for you're like the best dad ever like i couldn't ask for a better father you make me cry no stop he has nothing to be sorry for you know and a part of me believes that he decided to pass on at this specific time, obviously because he was in a lot of pain and he just wanted to end it. But he knew that I had started college and he had that like faith in me that you're going to make it, you know, like you're in college now. You got this. You don't you don't like need me to be there for you physically <laughs> because I know he's still here spiritually. Yeah. Um, so we all took our turn saying goodbye to him. A few hours went by of them again injecting this medication into his body and there was a point where he just wasn't there anymore so we knew that he had gone into that kind of like coma state we knew that he wasn't there mentally even though his right. body was still was still there like breathing it was about 11 p.m at night so we were there from 10 a.m all the way to 11 p.m at 11 p.m they finally decided to unplug him from his ventilator which was what was keeping him alive and okay. breathing since his lungs didn't work he obviously passed which was the whole end end goal of this he passed away at 11 p.m at night that was the longest day of my life the worst day of my life it was such a draining process for all of us physically yeah. and emotionally because it was like on and off again crying like is he gone is is he still yeah. there it's it's, it's a weird it's, thing it's traumatic too it's oh yeah. definitely so like us going into this thinking it's something that we say goodbye and they do it and he's gone but no it's the fact that he's not there anymore but he's laying on that bed and his yeah. body's still alive it's just and i was in that room the whole time because i wasn't gonna let him out of my sight like i mm -hmm. needed to see all that so when they announced his time of death, I remember his body had quickly turned blue, like his skin color had turned blue. I've never seen that before. When I went to touch his hand, it was ice cold. It's like a feeling that I can't describe and I mm -hmm. don't want to experience it anytime soon. Um, a few of my family members that were there, one of them actually passed out, like just fainted really? when that happened. It was just... It's a lot. It was a yeah. lot. Like, you can feel, like, just this doom in the room. Mm -hmm. Like, everyone's stomach just dropped. My grandma, his mom, that he managed to bring when he became a citizen. She was crying hysterically. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when we finally had to leave the room, obviously because it had all been over. She was crying and saying, why are we leaving my son there? Don't leave. Why are we leaving him in this room? Like, just leaving his body behind, pretty much. So it was just very traumatic. Mm -hmm. um, we, that night when we went home, it was such a weird feeling. It felt like a huge part of my life was just ripped away from me, which it was. That's That was my dad. Yeah, he was gone. Like his, even, you know, his, <laughs> even though he wasn't able to do certain things, he was still there, yes. you know? So then if he's just gone, you know, you feel that. When somebody's gone, you can, you literally feel that they're gone. Yes. And the fact that he wasn't in the room anymore right and so it just it didn't feel real i went home that night and i remember i was staring into his room where he would where his bed was his bed was still there mm -hmm. he just wasn't in it anymore and i was like wow like this is it like he's actually gone so um we always knew this was gonna happen i just didn't think it would happen so soon i thought i would be a little bit older you know but again, I do feel like he felt confident enough at that point in time to pass and know that we were going to be okay. Mm -hmm. So this literally made me like mature earlier than I wanted to. I became more responsible. Um, I view life in like a different perspective now just because of going through these situations growing up. It made me take on more responsibility mm -hmm. so i did graduate with my bachelor's i graduated in may so a couple months ago thank you um i graduated and got my bachelor's and i'm only 21 years old yeah. so 
that was a huge thing that I wanted to do for not only myself, but for my dad and for my family. So that was like the first step of me saying, okay, I'm going to bring this American dream and give it to my family. Even though my dad's not here anymore, I know that he's still watching over me. And I know that this is what he wants. I still feel his presence. I know that he's with me, guiding me. So now that I'm working in my career field, I'm able to do these things for my family and take my mom out. Things that we couldn't do when I was younger because there was like no possible way to do so. Because of my dad getting sick and this affecting like our whole dynamic of our family, we didn't have the normal experiences that you would as a family. So because he was sick, we couldn't take those family vacations. We couldn't go to those family dinners that people would go to. We didn't really go out much at all because there was no income to do so. Right. So, and I was a child, so I wasn't working yet. Now I'm able to do these things for my family, take my mom out, and it feels great because I'm able to provide for them in a way that I wasn't able to before. I know that my dad is so proud of me and that he wants me to do this for them. He left this earth with a hope of us being able to take his sacrifice of coming to the United States and make a good life out of it because his end goal was always the American dream. Like I want to give my kids a better life. So I never want to let him down. So that's why I always just strive to like push myself further and like be as successful as I can be because he went through so much to get here. So why wouldn't I? And that's so true. And also too, obviously, like I said, he's so proud of you. Um, And he always will be. And I think too, it seems like, you know, obviously a situation like this is extremely hard. And it's traumatic and it's all of these things that help you grow as a person and make you stronger. But it's normal to feel and it's normal to have moments where you break down. Like we're human, we're supposed to feel. And it even feeling and like experiencing those emotions again, sometimes it helps us grow even stronger, you know? And it always teaches us things. And I feel like it seems like you are the rock, you know? At least I obviously I I don't know much about your (laughs) other siblings or anything, but it seems like you really hold it together. And that's almost like your role now. And I feel like that's amazing. And not only does that make yourself proud, but your dad proud. And you really are the obviously like I don't even think it. I know it just based on meeting you today. It's like you are going to accomplish everything that you want to accomplish. And like I said, for yourself, for your dad. And that's that's all that matters. And I I think that even though his story is tragic and sad, it's like his younger life and how he got here and how hard he tried and managed to get you know to the United States and give you guys a better life and a better family like that's incredible on its own you know and that that is such a powerful story and then even hearing how strong he stayed through everything is powerful on its own and I feel like that too what I was going to say also is I feel like his strength probably reflects on the whole family because I think when you see that it's like it really goes to show no matter what I go through, if if my dad could get through this, like I can get through anything. Right. Which right. I think is, like I said, it's powerful. It's moving um, for especially I think for you guys and the family, but also just for people hearing it. And I that's something that I realized too. It's like we – little things in life, we can really think like the, our world is coming to an end and it's like, oh my God, I have the worst life and all this. But then when you really hear what people are going through or have gone through – whether that be you experiencing it and your dad experiencing it firsthand, it's like it really puts into perspective that what people really can experience and that the little things, they're really not as bad as we think. Um, But no, I just think that you're so strong. Like I said, I think you really are. And I think that I know, I always say I think that. I know that he's very proud of you. I'm proud of you. I think it's amazing that you came on here and told his story. Um, You said that he wrote a book right? He did write a book. Okay. So is that like something that people could buy and read or? So yeah, he wrote this book in, I think it was 2013, 2014. So a couple years back, my mom and my brother helped edit the book. So they published it on Amazon. Okay. So it is available on Amazon. Okay. Because I was going to, I was going to say, I will link it in the description because I think that would be amazing because I'm sure like, I just, I love, I love his story. I think that it's incredible in so many ways, like I said. Literally, it sounds like a movie. Yeah, right. Um, and I, I think that it's incredible, too, that you were able to come on here and share it. And I'm sure 
even just by doing that, that's just like, it shows your strength. I'm sure he's so proud of you and so happy that you are getting his story out on this type of platform and people get to hear about it. And it's just all incredible. And I'm really proud of you. And I, I think it's amazing that you Thanks came so on much. here. Of course, Thank of you. course. Hey guys, if you want to support this podcast, click the survey link in the description down below.